Our subject today is forgiveness. I think the book that has influenced or made the greatest impact on me in terms of the subject of forgiveness is the book entitled The Sunflower. I'm actually holding it in my hand, written by Simon Weisenthal. Weisenthal was a noted Nazi hunter after World War II. He hunted down the Nazi criminals. But he was, as a youth, imprisoned in a Nazi concentration camp. And what prompted his book was the memory of an event when he was called from his work detail, taken to the side of a dying German soldier, a member of the feared SS, who, as he faced eternity, was haunted with guilt of the crimes he had committed against Jews. And he had called a Jew to his bedside so he could confess his sins in the hopes that the Jew would forgive him so he could die in peace. He confessed a litany of horrible atrocities. You can read it in the book to Simon Weisenthal, and then said, Can you forgive me? Weisenthal stood there, paused, and then walked out of the room, having said nothing. Years later, Weisenthal was troubled by the thought, Did I do the right thing? The book, The Sunflower, is a collection of 53 essays from distinguished men and women of the era responding to Simon's question, did I do the right thing? Now, this book will not help you answer or find a gospel answer for forgiveness or what it is or how it happens, but it will help you understand the question and the drama and the dilemma of forgiveness. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, we invite your spirit to be our teacher. We thank you for your word, which doesn't just present the problem of forgiveness, but it points us to a glorious solution. You be our teacher in Jesus' name and for the sake of the kingdom. Amen. Let's read scripture. We're in Genesis chapter 45. This will be our next to the last lesson in the book of Genesis. This may be the most dramatic portion in the Old Testament. I don't have the oratorical or dramatic skills to read this with the emotional drama it deserves. But this is when Joseph reveals his identity and his forgiveness, which leads to reconciliation with the brothers who had kidnapped him, sold him as a slave, betrayed him, hated him 22 years earlier. Chapter 45. Then Joseph could not control himself and excuse me, then Joseph could not control himself before all those who stood by him. And he cried out, make everyone go from me. So no one stayed with him when Joseph made himself known to his brothers. And he wept aloud so that the Egyptians heard it and the household of Pharaoh heard it. And Joseph said to his brothers, now the interpreter is gone here. He had been speaking to his brothers in Egyptian through an interpreter who would have translated into Hebrew. But now he speaks Hebrew. He has no need of an interpreter. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. Is my father still alive? But his brothers could not answer him for they were dismayed at his presence. So Joseph said to his brothers, 
Come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am your brother, Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. The famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. It was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Hurry, go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord over all Egypt. Come down to me. Do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen. You shall be near me, you and your children and your children's children and your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, for there are yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin. That's the first time he's named the name of his brother, which was, if they needed it, proof of his identity, because how did he know his name? My brother Benjamin, see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. I'm speaking to you in Hebrew. We don't need an interpreter. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen. Hurry, bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept upon his neck, and he kissed all of his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Turn to chapter 50, and let me add just one final paragraph. Chapter 50, after their father dies, the brothers wonder if this Forgiveness and reconciliation was genuine. Chapter 50, verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive, there's the word, the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear. Am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and for your little ones. Thus, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. If you've got your notes, let's follow along. The Unnatural Act. In October of 2006, many of you will remember that there were two very dramatic stories in the news. The first story was of five Amish schoolgirls who were viciously murdered in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania. It was a horrific story. 
of a crazy, cruel man who went into a schoolhouse and took 10 girls ages 6 to 13, lined them up against a chalkboard, and at point-blank range shot them all. Five of them died. That was the first story. But the second story that captured maybe even more space in the news was the Amish community forgave the murderer and then reached out in love and grace to his widow and their three children. And if my memory serves me well, the news media had more trouble coming to grips with the second story than the first. The press struggled to determine which of these stories was more noteworthy. Violence, unfortunately, is rather routine. But forgiveness? Well, that's almost inexplicable. How do you explain Forgiveness in the face of a crime like this. Letter B. Perhaps there is no single word that captures what the gospel is all about than forgiveness. It's what Philip Yancey calls the unnatural act. The natural thing is vengeance, evening the score. Forgiveness is what the gospel is all about. It embraces both the vertical and the horizontal aspects of what Jesus came to make possible. The vertical aspect is when God through Christ forgives me for the horrific things I've done. The horizontal aspect is the reality that now that I have been forgiven, I am able to forgive. You'll remember the words of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses as, some have said the word as is the most troubling word in the whole prayer, as we forgive those who trespass against us. In other words, Lord, use the same forgiveness standard of forgiveness on me as I use on other people because the vertical and the horizontal aspects of forgiveness go together. One validates and gives evidence of the other. Letter C. Revenge. How sweet it is. Question mark. One of the most natural instincts of the human condition is the passion to get even, to settle the score, to restore moral balance. I like that concept, moral balance. If you kill five Amish schoolgirls, the moral balance of the universe has been upset. Now, how do you restore? the balance. Well, revenge is the typical way. If you hurt me, then I should hurt you in a similar manner. This, after all, reflects the image of God. It is a cry for justice. And whatever the image of God may be, it certainly includes justice. What is the right thing to do to establish moral balance in this universe? It shall be life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. That's a quote from the Mosaic Law. Look at my footnote there. Today, what is called the Law of Retaliation, or if you'd like to impress your friends, the Latin Lex Talionis, is often considered barbaric and cruel, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Usually when people quote that, they're referring to 
something barbaric in their mind. However, God actually gave that law to limit cruelty so that the punishment would fit the crime. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, that's justice. That's fair. You see, most of human history is composed of the fact, if you steal my chicken, then I'll steal your cow. And then you, to make the restore balance, will burn down my house, which causes me to bomb your village, which causes your country to declare war on my country. And this ever-increasing insanity of the spiral of retaliation. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was God's way, at least under the Mosaic dispensation, to reestablish moral equilibrium. The world's literature, number two, reminds us that this desire for revenge is one of the classic themes of the stories we love. I had fun this week trying to remind myself of the stories about revenge, the Iliad, perhaps the grandmother of all stories of revenge. When Menelaus's wife, Helen, was kidnapped, then he declares war on Troy. And the Trojan War, is all about revenge. My favorite story of revenge, The Count of Monte Cristo. If you want to watch a good movie, that's a good one. But it's all about how Edmund Dantes, unjustly put in prison, spends years plotting revenge. Alexander Dumas writes an incredible story. And it sort of culminates when he's asked near the end of the story, how did I escape? With difficulty. How did I plan this moment? With pleasure. Or many of you will remember watching with your children the movie Princess Bride and the young Spanish swordsman who lives for the day when he will be able to say, to the six-fingered man he's pursuing, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. We love these stories because they appeal to that passion for justice or vengeance. But of course, it never works out quite the one seeking vengeance hopes that it will. The, prime, the Chinese proverb says it well. The man who opts for revenge digs two graves. Imagine letter D, the story of Joseph ending this way. I just read you from chapter 45. But if imagine if the story had read this way. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm Joseph. I've been waiting 22 years. Prepare to die. <laughs> Aren't you glad that Alexander Dumas is not the author of the story of Joseph? But God is capturing the true story of that moment when forgiveness became reconciliation. This story is in the Bible precisely because it is so counterintuitive. It's not what you expect. It demands a supernatural explanation. Quickly, let me give a little background. Summary of the book of Genesis. The story of Joseph's reconciliation with his brothers is the climax of the book of Genesis. Now, I'm a little hesitant with this interpretation of the whole book, but I'm leaning toward the fact that this is what the book has been building to ever since the Garden of Eden. Here, uh, excuse me, 
it is almost as if this scene summarizes what the book is all about. Thinking back through the chapters of Genesis, we could summarize the message this way. Number one, God made humans and placed them in a perfect environment, the Garden of Eden. Here there was perfect and harmonious unity. Everything was in equilibrium. Everything was balanced. And just as God was one, yet three, so his creation is meant to be a plurality of oneness and a oneness of plurality. That's Eden. Number two, but when sin came, the consequences were catastrophic and the equilibrium, the balance, was thrown out of kilter. The unity was broken, and the harmony became discordant. The result was alienation or separation. There was separation from God, vertically. There was separation from ourselves, internally. Adam no longer knew who he was. Letter C, there was separation from life's purpose. Why am I here? D, there's separation from one another. Cain kills his brother Abel. And E, there's separation from home. They were expelled from Eden and lived east of Eden for the rest of human history and homesickness. Let number three, God called Abraham to deal with this problem of alienation and separation and disequilibrium on planet Earth. And a covenant was made with him and his family so that these separations could all be mended. Joseph's reunion with his family shows us a glimpse of what this looks like. Genesis 45 gives us a hint of what God wants to do in and through our lives. Though we still live east of Eden, I repeat that because that's the name of the study I've given to the book of Genesis. East of Eden. We're not in Eden. We live east of Eden. But in Genesis 45, we catch a glimpse of Eden's gates. We're not there, but We can see it from here. When Joseph and his brothers experience forgiveness and subsequently reconciliation, you can smell the aromas of the garden. You can see the gates if you have eyes to see. Using theological terminology, we can say that forgiveness makes possible reconciliation, where all those separations that characterize human existence are begin beginning to be reconciled. Genesis 45, brief commentary. Joseph and his brothers have been communicating through an interpreter. But when he reveals himself, he dismisses the interpreter, and it must have been a dramatic moment. I wish I could be a movie producer to produce it, like a Steven Spielberg. When Joseph begins to speak fluent Hebrew to the brothers who assumed he was an Egyptian who didn't even understand their language, I am Joseph. A, Joseph's emotions become too powerful to contain. His weeping is heard all the way to Pharaoh's palace. This is the third time he weeps, but it will not be the last. This reminds us of the emotional transparency of both David and Jesus. This is not the place or the time to study emotions, but the emotions of Joseph, the emotions of David, the emotions of Jesus make for a great biblical study. 
Three times Joseph affirms God is the one who sent me to Egypt. Did you hear it as I read it? You brothers, you didn't send me here. God sent me here. God sent me here. God sent me here. The brothers are to blame, but God is responsible. <clears throat> Do you see the blanks there? The brothers are to blame. They are guilty. They have committed sin. They've done something terribly wrong. They're to blame. But God, Joseph has come to realize, is the one who is responsible for my being here because the God I worship is sovereign and his providence rules my life. The ability to discern the difference between who's to blame and who is responsible is a game changer. That's so important, I'm going to say it again. When Joseph got to the point where he could make the theological distinction between who's to blame and who's responsible. That was a game-changing moment in the life of Joseph. Joseph's studies at Pitt State University have caused him to become a theologian. You see, for reconciliation to take place, we need more than psychology. We need theology. And one of the problems in the ways we deal with human brokenness in relationships in our world today is we make it a psychological and a sociological issue and leave out the theological foundations that make reconciliation possible. And a big part of that is learning to distinguish between who's to blame, who has sinned, and who is ultimately responsible. Letter C, it's obvious that Joseph has already forgiven his brothers. When Genesis 45 begins, it's obvious that there's no bitterness, there's no hatred, there's not even a trace of revenge, but it took Judah's speech, what we looked at last week, to enable Joseph to be ready for reconciliation. To forgive is one thing. To reconcile is another step. I wish we knew more about when and how Joseph reached the point where he was able to get the poison out of his system and to forgive his brothers. But just because you forgive doesn't mean you're ready to reconcile. That's another step. Bear with me. Last week, we looked at Roman numeral three, the elements of reconciliation. A brief refresher of what we saw last week. The elements that make reconciliation possible are guilt, when the offender experiences the conviction of sin, and we saw last week how the brothers for 22 years had been living with a guilty conscience. Number two, confession. Rather than denying, rationalizing, justifying, blaming, or suppressing their sin, the brothers acknowledged their sin. We saw that last week. Thirdly, repentance. More than just feeling bad about what they had done, repentance means a change of mind, a change of heart. We saw that last week. And fourthly, substitution. We saw this in Reuben's, excuse me, in uh, Judah's speech, where Judah said, put me in prison and let Benjamin go. I'll be the substitute. 
Sinful acts of injustice can't be ignored as if they didn't happen. Someone must pay the guilt. Either the guilty party must pay the price or a substitute must be found. Now, all of that sets us up. It's been a lengthy introduction. For the fifth element that is necessary for that moment when Joseph embraces and kisses and reconciles with his brother. And what makes that possible? The blank there in letter B, forgiveness. Please forgive our transgressions. I'm at Roman numeral four. The reason many people struggle with forgiveness, I've learned, is because they don't understand forgiveness, at least in part. Let's begin by talking about what forgiveness is not. A, forgiveness is not forgetting. The Bible tells us that God forgets our sins. Those references in the Old Testament tell us that he puts his, our sins behind his back. He casts our sins in the ocean. He remembers them not against us. Now, God can forgive and forget, but you and I are not God. When you forgive someone, there's no delete button. You know, we love the technology of computers, and one of my favorite abilities of a computer is the delete button, the erase key. It's a wonderful key. But in the human psyche, unfortunately, we don't have one of those buttons. God must have one somewhere in his memory, a delete. Joseph could not pretend that the past never happened. In fact, I think he did pretend. He named his son Manasseh, which means forgetfulness. But I think every dinner table conversation, when he looked at forgetfulness, he was reminded of what he was trying to forget. Because we can't forget what has happened. Forgiveness is a, the blank there, is a choice an act of the will. When we forgive, we agree to live with the consequences of someone else's sin. I think it was Clara Barton who once commented on an offense by saying, oh yeah, I remember I forgot that. That's emotionally honest. That's emotional honesty. I remember having forgotten that. You can feel in her the choice, the deliberate choice to I'm putting that aside. Corey Ten Boom picturesquely said that when we are forgiven, Jesus throws our sins into the sea of God's forgetfulness and then puts a sign there that says, no fishing. That's good. No fishing. Maybe you heard the story of the man who was talking to his counselor about his marriage. And he said, yeah, every time my wife and I fight, she gets historical. The counselor said, do you mean she gets hysterical? The husband said, no, not my wife. She gets historical. She starts repeating all the bad things I've done for the last 27 years. She remembers them well. Now, that's a good illustration of what forgiveness is not. Because when you forgive someone, you make a conscious choice not to use what you did against me as a weapon. Letter B, forgiveness is not condoning. When Joseph forgave his brothers, he was not saying what they did to him was okay. 
It wasn't okay. He was not excusing their inexcusable behavior. To say, I forgive you, doesn't mean it's okay what you did. It's possible to forgive and at the same time agree that the offenders be held accountable, be arrested, be fired, be fined, whatever the issue. Forgiven sin still has consequences. Forgiveness means that in those areas where you are in charge, you will not press the matter further. In ultimate terms, to forgive means you are taking offenders off your hook, take them off your hook, and put them on God's hook. Vengeance belongs to God, not to you and not to me. Letter C, forgiveness is not pretending. I've been a pastor long enough to see people pretend. Many try to deal with the pain caused by someone else's behavior by saying, oh, it doesn't really hurt. They didn't really mean it. It was no big deal when it was. Often such persons extend the olive branch of forgiveness prematurely, primarily in an effort to ease their own memory. But pretending to make things right with someone who is not yet trustworthy and safe is not only naive, it may be dangerous. I remember working with a pre-marriage couple as they prepared for their wedding day. He was living overseas. She was living locally. She came one day and said, well, I got some bad news. I discovered my fiance has been unfaithful to me in the country where he's living. I said, oh my goodness. And what did you do? And she said rather piously, oh, I forgave him. I gave her a fairly lengthy lecture at that point on the dangers of premature forgiveness. I told her it's not spiritual to forgive a man who is untrustworthy and to rebuild trust may take time. But forgiveness is not pretending. Letter D, I think I was 50 years old before I understood this one. Forgiveness is not reconciliation. Many think forgiveness means they should be chummy again with the person who hurt them. No. To forgive an abuser doesn't mean that you invite him back into the house. Has he expressed guilt, confession, and repentance? Reestablishing the relationship can only be based in trust, and trust must be earned. Trust is not given. Trust is earned. Joseph, I think, forgave his brothers, but it took several trips back and forth to Egypt and many months of working through the reality to prove their repentance before Joseph was ready to reconcile. You see, forgiveness is a unilateral act. All it takes is one person to forgive. Regardless of what the offender does or doesn't do, I can still get the poison out of my system by forgiving. It can be done regardless of the actions or inactions of the offender. It gets the poison out of our system before the poison kills us. But reconciliation is bilateral. It takes two. Meeting somewhere on common ground 
Reconciliation takes two, meeting on common ground. It is only possible when mutual trust is firmly in place. Joseph had forgiven his brothers, but he was not prepared to reconcile with them until he was certain they were safe. Okay, we're almost done. We've seen what forgiveness is not. Now let's ask the question, Roman numeral five. So what is forgiveness? Perhaps the best definition, at least for me, of forgiveness is this. Forgiveness is giving up our right to use what someone else did as a weapon against them. Giving up our right to use as a weapon against you what you did to me. I still remember the day vividly sitting in the living room of a couple where I was pastor. He had been unfaithful to his wife. And oh my goodness, she pummeled and beat the death, beat the life out of him month after month after month for what he had done. It was awful on both counts. I came to the place where I explained to them both. Forgiveness is when you, and I looked at the offended party, the wife, when you give up the right, because you have a right, to use what he did in having an affair with his secretary as a weapon. I still remember the terror on her face when she came to consider what it would mean for her if she couldn't use that weapon anymore. I said, that's what forgiveness is. That's what Christ did on the cross for each of us. Joseph clearly, I'm back in the notes, Joseph clearly had the right to press charges and have his brothers arrested. Listen to what they are guilty of for kidnapping, child trafficking. Joseph was 17 years old. He was a minor when they sold him as a slave. Slave trading, conspiracy, and obstruction of justice. In forgiving them, he gave up the right. He had a legitimate right, but he didn't insist on his rights. He gave up the right that he had. And he, the next blank there, absorbed. I like that word. He absorbed in himself like a sponge the horrific consequences of their actions. He broke the insanity of an ever-increasing cycle of retaliation. That spiral, you steal my chicken, I take your cow, you burn down my house, I attack your village, that cycle of retaliation that characters so much of human history. Mahatma Gandhi, a Hindu, said it well, if we practice the rule for an eye for an eye, we will eventually all be blind. Who's going to break the cycle? You see, if Joseph had insisted on his rights, and pressed charges, legitimate charges, to try to even the moral balance, we would have all understood and said, you have a right. We understand. That makes sense. But when Joseph chose to absorb the consequences of their choices and their sinful behaviors, then he broke the cycle of retaliation. So how does this work? 
Just a few points as we close. How did it work for Joseph? Number one, see the big picture. And by this, I mean think theologically. Don't look at reconciliation as just a psychological challenge. It's a theological challenge. Listen to what Joseph said to his brothers. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here, for God sent me. I want to say, no, he didn't. The brothers sent him there. No, Joseph said, I've been thinking about this for 22 years. I've been to Pitt State University. God sent me here. Verse 7, God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. It was not you who sent me here, but God. Joseph realizes that his brothers are to blame, but he knows that God is responsible. We can debate whether God causes bad things to happen, or whether he permits them to happen. That's an important conversation to have, but reconciliation can only happen when we bow before a sovereign God and say, Lord, what are you trying to do in and through this painful situation that Obviously, you have in your sovereign purposes permitted in my life. I know what my brothers were trying to do, but is it possible that you're trying to do something? My brothers meant it for evil. Is it possible that you mean it for good? Thomas Akempis said it so succinctly. Man proposes, but God disposes. Number two, how does reconciliation work and forgiveness work? Stop trying to be God's prosecuting attorney. You see, that's what this woman whose husband had cheated on her was trying to do. She wanted to be God's prosecuting attorney. Listen to how Paul says it in Romans. Beloved, never avenge yourselves. Leave it to the wrath of God. God will take care of your husband. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heat burning coals on his head. Don't be overcome by evil. Overcome evil with good. To forgive people does not mean you are pronouncing them innocent. Let me say that again. To forgive people does not mean that you are pronouncing them innocent. It means you are taking them off your hook and putting them on God's hook. Remember, Jesus is our... Remember in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, what it says? We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus is our advocate. That means he's our lawyer. He's a good lawyer. And at the judgment bar of God on the great day, you can be sure that Jesus is going to plead your case before the Father and he'll get it all said perfectly and the score will be balanced. The moral equilibrium will be reestablished. We have a very good lawyer. Let him plead your case before the divine tribunal. Number three, how does it work? This is the hard one. Absorb the pain. 
I love what C.S. Lewis says. Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Those who say that forgiveness is easy simply don't know what they're talking about. On the cross, Jesus forgave our sins by absorbing them into himself. He became sin for us. That's what the cross is. Our sins went there. And like a sponge, he absorbed them. There he forever gave up the right to use what we did as a weapon against us. He has a right to use those things against us, but he's given up that right. That's what forgiveness means. He absorbed the pain into himself. Now listen to this. This may be the whole point of the lesson for someone listening. To a limited degree, we do the same thing whenever we forgive someone who has hurt us. This explains perhaps the lengthy process Joseph went through as he absorbed the reality of what it would mean to forgive his brothers. It took him months to work through this. Christ sends us into the world to minister in the same way he ministered, though obviously not to the same degree. Remember after the resurrection in John chapter 20, when Jesus showed them his hands, nail pierced, and he said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And he's showing them his hands. What did the Father send me to do? The Father sent me to absorb the pain. The Father sent me to lay down my life. The Father sent me to experience the cross. See my hands? Now I'm sending you in the same way. He wants us to fill up in our bodies what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ. One of the verses in the New Testament that intrigues me more than any others, where Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in the atonement, in the sufferings of Christ. Now, Paul's action doesn't save our souls. Only Jesus does that. But when Paul absorbs the pain and the sin of others, he's playing his part in making redemption possible through the forgiveness of sins, which makes reconciliation. The gates of Eden are in sight which makes reconciliation possible. When death works in us, life can work in someone else. Finally, number four, when you are able, begin to let your actions express your theology. When Joseph finally embraced his brothers and kissed them. Oh my goodness, it must have been a moment. And he was not emotionally ready to do that for a long time. But when the moment came, then there was the embrace. Only at the end of the lengthy process was Joseph able to find the grace that enabled him to embrace his brothers. To be a family again took more than guilt, confession, repentance, and substitution, and forgiveness. It took a miracle of divine grace to make that possible. You've heard the story. It's been told so many times, but frankly, I couldn't find a better story than this of Corey Ten Boom, who had 
Been sent as a prisoner to the Nazi concentration camps, the war ended, and in 1947, she was speaking in Munich, Germany, to a German audience on the subject of forgiveness. And in her book, Tramp for the Lord, she tells that at the close of the service, a man came up to her, and she recognized him. And he said something like this, Madam Fraulein, you mentioned Ravensbrück, the concentration camp, in your message. I was a guard there. But since the war, I've become a Christian, and I know God has forgiven me for the things I've done. But it would be so nice to hear you say, who were a prisoner there, I forgive you. She writes in her book how she froze as all the memories and the emotion and the pain of her time in prison came rushing back. The guard had extended his hand and Corey Ten Boom writes these words. And so, woodenly, mechanically, I thrust my hand into the one stretched out to me. And as I did, an incredible thing took place. The current started in my shoulder, raced down my arm, sprang into our joined hands, and then the healing warmth seemed to flood my whole being, bringing tears to my eyes. I forgive you, brother, she said, with all my heart. Ultimately, reconciliation is possible only because of that warmth of the redeeming grace of Christ through his cross, working through us, extended to others. Father, thank you for your word tonight. Wherever this message applies, we give you permission to push us, to nudge us, to take the next step. Enable us to get the poison of unforgiveness out of our systems, And even through your grace, make it possible, where it's possible, to find reconciliation. Lord Jesus, have your way in each and every heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.